Hi everyone, here's the Book Chemist once again and welcome to the sixth installment in my Gravity's Rainbow Reading Project. Uh, today I'll be discussing the very last part of the book's part three uh, in the zone. Uh, we're actually approaching the last two segments in this reading project, which are going to be shorter uh, than this previous one. All that's left to read is part four, the counterforce. And I don't repeat this too often, but please know that I'm extremely grateful to all of you who comment to these videos, and especially to those of you who actually read alongside me. When I started this thing, I really had no idea whether anyone would be interested or whether you would actually be reading together with me um, and now actually I'm, I'm very happy about uh, your feedback to this project and I'm actually thinking about maybe doing something more in the future uh, either with another Pincho novel or with a different author entirely but I'll talk about that more uh, in the future. Now this section we read is a mixed one to me. It featured some of my favorite passages from the entire novel and passages I admit I did not remember at all from my first reading. Uh, I'm talking in particular of two passages. The first one is the one where we get the story of Slothrop's ancestor, the preacher. William Slothrop is the name, this unconventional preacher in Puritan America, leading his pigs to the slaughter while still loving them so much and wandering around the American landscape. Uh, and that figure is explicitly discussed in Gravity's Rainbow as sort of a turning point in American history. Uh, Pynchon, especially in these early novels in Gravity's Rainbow, is so concerned with the implications of Western philosophy. There is this idea in Pynchon that Europe as a place with its history and its ideas is uh, inevitably corrupted, and I'll talk about that more later, or at least that there is something rotten at its core, even though it is not, as a place, it is not necessarily hopeless, uh, both in terms of its people, in terms of its ideas. Uh, but even more than that, Pynchon, of course, is a quintessentially American writer. There's that idea in Pynchon that America had the chance to be different from Europe and was originally created, or at least it had the potential of getting rid of these negative sides of the European equation, uh, but that the early promise of America was instead rejected in order to make America as corrupted as the rest of Europe. And again, I'll talk about this maybe uh, more later into the video. That idea, uh, the, the great potential and the dramatic corruption of early America is of course a key feature in uh, Gravity's, uh, sorry, in Mason and Dixon, but it is explored through this passage in very clear terms. The other section I absolutely adored is the one with Frau Garb and Otto uh, and the ship and the rescue mission to save Springer uh, and Nerish, poor Nerish being left behind, such uh, an action-packed um, scene with the chimps uh, running all over the place and there's such an emotional punch in that scene and you get Otto describing the mother of the year contest and, and Frau Garb is probably my favorite character from the novel and I love her sea chanty very much. I love the, the songs in general but that one is, is beautiful. Uh, I'm a big fan of a, a pirate metal, pow power metal slash pirate metal band called Ailstorm. Uh, I do firmly believe they should record a cover of Frau Garb's sea shanty. But this section also features featured several very difficult and painful passages, as in uh, quite complicated and cryptic and very dense. Here, more than in uh, previous of these reading sections, uh, I had to refer very often to um, Michael David Bell's guide to what happens in each of the passages from Gravity's Rainbow. I mentioned it in a previous video, but I'll put a link to it again in the description box. If you're having trouble uh, figuring out what actually happens in terms of plot and characters in each of these sections, that guide is absolutely uh, golden. Uh, it's truly very, very useful. The passage with Pirate Prentice and Katia toward the end of part three uh, was one of these very dense passages. I had uh, quite some difficulties wrapping my head around. Uh, and in terms of this, in terms of Gravity's Rainbow's difficulty, uh, Steven Weisenberger, in his this, uh, his section on Gravity's Rainbow in the Cambridge Companion to Thomas Pynchon, he describes, he talks about a letter that Pynchon apparently wrote to a Cornell professor, where he said that he, he talks a little bit, Pynchon, about the writing process behind Gravity's Rainbow, and he says that the novel is either coming to him from some external source, <laughs> some, some, something like a dictation from above, or that it is going to be so much more difficult for, 
you know, all the the hard work is going to be left to the reader, and then the readers will have to unpack it um, and to have a hell of a difficult time making sense of it. That's a very Pinchonian statement, and the second possibility will resonate loudly with people who maybe are not necessarily big Pinchon fans or don't really enjoy Gravity's Rainbow. I'm not 100% sure, but I believe it was Gore Vidal, famous American writer and critic, who said that Gravity's Rainbow uh, is definitely and certainly much more difficult to read than it possibly was to write. Uh, and maybe he didn't say this specific statement, but Gore Vidal for sure uh, was not a big Pynchon fan at all. Whereas the first option, the idea of this manuscript as some sort of uh, almost supernatural occurrence being dictated by a higher power, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it sounds like something out of Gravity's Rainbow, but Steven Weiss Eisenberger in that essay, which I recommend, it's a good essay, uh, he suggests that it's a common, it's a common idea uh, among historical novels, the fact that once you research your material so extensively and so thoroughly, uh, what you're going to write basically comes out of your notes, so that it, it almost seems like it's not you who's writing it, it's the notes themselves that are rearranging themselves in the form of narrative. And of course, Pynchon, I remarked on this in the past uh, more than possibly any other genre, he definitely is a historical novelist. Uh, he himself has expressed the view that he, he considers himself a historical novelist. If for whatever reason you don't know this, Google Pynchon McEwan, uh, even better, I'll put a link in the description box. Um, one of the most beautiful things Pynchon wrote was a letter in, I think, 2006, uh, defending Ian McEwan, British author, from accusations of plagiarism. And in that letter, he talks about, Pynchon talks about the, uh, the job of the historical novel, novelist, the purpose of it, uh, and the beautiful nature of it, uh, in such amazing terms. And in this video, I wanted to talk a bit about that, about Pynchon's historical accuracy, uh, Pynchon, through his scientific and technological uh, and geographical and historical details, it's absolutely clear that he researched the hell out of his material. Um, I've remarked in the past on how Gravity's Rainbow sometimes feels like it was written under the influence of some exotic shroom and never edited, and I'm personally convinced part, parts of it were written that way. Uh, that is not to say that uh, lots of effort didn't go into this manuscript and that it's not a thoroughly researched historical narrative. Uh, David Coward, in his book uh, Thomas Pynchon and the Dark Passages of History, which I've said in the past, in my opinion, is possibly the best book, secondary source, written on Pynchon. Uh, in that book, he has a chapter where he talks about the relationship between Pynchon and Germany. Because it seems, all at times, let me know if you had this same impression, but it seemed to me at times that Pynchon aggressively dislikes Germany and German culture in the same way as it seemed to me that in others of his books, most notably Mason and Dixon, he aggressively dislikes British culture. Uh, but I do believe that that's just a superficial impression and that it doesn't take into account the complex structure of the book, which is, by the way, related to that idea of the historical accuracy of the novel. The point, it seems to me, and it seems definitely to David Coward, he argues about it very beautifully in that chapter, the point is that Pynchon is pointing in Gravity's Rainbow at the hidden costs and at the hidden perversions of Western and German philosophy and ideas in particular, at the horrible consequences of it, at the horrible consequences, for instance, of this striving of the West, striving toward ever greater in technological innovations, as represented once again in the rocket, which may be a symbol of salvation, it may take humans into space, it all may also doom us all to destruction. But the first and most tangible proof that Pynchon doesn't hate, but hate is not the right word, I'm not talking here about whether Pynchon hates Germans or not, that is neither here nor there, uh, what I'm saying is the proof that Pynchon is not unjustly unfair toward Germans is how informed Gravity's Rainbow is by German thought of all sorts. In the book Pynchon references Max Weber and Marx, 
uh, and uh, Wagner uh, and Rilke, Fritz Lang, Beethoven, as we discussed last week. Uh, and I, I mean, Pinscher clearly knows his German culture very much. And uh, you will have to take my word for this. Uh, what I'm going to say is not truly scientific. I can't point to any essay that says that. But in my opinion, you can only really hate, blindly hate something such as, say, a culture or a person or a type of person or be a fanatic of that stuff if you don't know them very well. Uh, that, by the way, is one of the reasons why literature is important, why it should be taught in schools, why it should be taught to people, because when you know uh, other cultures, other people, when you know them directly and experience the way they live, it's impossible to hate them blindly, uh, and you are left either uh, with a uh, uninformed opinion of them, you may be, of course, uh, you still may dislike some elements of that culture. Uh, no one denies that, of course. Or you may love them in a genuine way, but it's impossible for you to just fucking hate them or to just adore them because they are perfect. And I say this as an Americanist, someone who studies American culture, who's never been in the US, and who maybe when I was uh, a teenager, uh, I had this blind fascination with the United States whereas now I've developed, I hope I've developed uh, a more critical perspective on, on them and it's not like I dislike them at all. I can't wait to visit. But moving on and going back to Germans in the novel, it seems to me that Pynchon is sometimes being rightfully critical of German ideas and ideology only or at least also to show how these uh, negative, these noxious, toxic effects, toxic sides of German culture paramount among this racism and fascism are far from absent in the rest of the West and not even exclusively in the West. In this sense, Major Marvy, who played a crucial role in the section we read these last two weeks, is a crucial character in the novel. And again, it's one of those characters I didn't remember that well from my first read, but he is so important, so very much, because he, he is... He, he is there, he is in the novel, besides being a uh, as much of a full-rounded character as you get in Pynchon. Sure, he's a bit of a character, sure, uh, he has those cartoonish overtones and also hellish overtones at, time, at times. Um, he very much represents all that's rotten in American uh, culture of his time. He is a racist, he hates, and uh, I mean, Slothrop uh, meets him uh, and he dis the first time they meet, he discusses so, uh, his terrible opinions of African Americans. He hates Ancien. Chicherin too, who is a Soviet agent, also hates Ancien. Paradoxically enough, uh, the one character in the novel who does not hate Ancien, or at least who develops this very sick, very morbid relationship with him, is Blissero, the Nazi himself. All of these things serve to complicate easy readings of World War II and of history with Nazi Germany as uh, absolutely evil and the uh, allied powers as champions of absolute good and it complicates the state of culture in all of these different realities and countries and of course complicating stuff is again a basic purpose in literature it happens even when you're not trying to do that it's uh, one of its basic functions uh, and it's what makes gravity's rainbow such a precious novel which is not at all to say that pynchon is being kind to germans or or that he is trying to um to obscure or to forget their war crimes i uh, actually it seems like some scholars claim that it's not at all like that and it seems to me like it seems to me very significant that the one German war crime the novel indulged, uh, I mean, shows uh, extensively, uh, or at least shows very clearly, is the Dora prisoner camp in Penemunde. The reason why that is significant is that, again, as with always, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that the Holocaust and concentration camps are widely taught at least in Western countries, as part of history. They are war crimes that are generally known by the public. Whereas the uh, prisoner camps, the horror of the prisoner camps uh, in Penemunde and in other um, rocket facilities, those are crimes that are not as widely known. 
In that sense, it seems to me that Pynchon, as a historical novelist, he's trying to shed some light on the darker passages of history, on the uh, shadow areas that are maybe not as widely known and that should, whose memory should still be preserved. In this sense, he very much is an instance of what Linda Achen, uh, a key scholar of postmodern literature, calls historiographic metafiction which is a complicated category, but to put it bluntly, it's histo postmodern historical novels that concern themselves, again, with shedding light on uh, little-known parts of history, maybe the history of marginalized groups, or the history of countercultures, or the history uh, of whatever group of people that you don't usually get to hear, whose side you usually don't get to hear. And whatever your critical opinion on historiographic metafiction as a category, I do believe that that's a crucial feature of Pinchonian historical fiction. Um, all in Against the Day too, or um, Bleeding Edge, which are novels concerned respectively with World War I and 9-11, kind of the same happens. World War I and 9-11 are not are almost not discussed at all, at least not directly in their novels. In Bleeding Edge you do not get to see the terrorist attacks on the Twin Towers, if not in very brief paragraphs. Uh, the novel instead focuses on the months before the attacks and on the months following them, maybe on some uh, bits of knowledge, on some narrative snippets that have escaped say, ma mainstream retellings of the event. Uh, the same with Against the Day and World War I. The war itself is not discussed extensively, is only discussed uh, externally, with characters talking about it as it happens, and you do not get to indulge in the bloodiest battles or in the most gripping, let's say, moments. History, in this sense, is stripped of its entertainment value and Pynchon instead focuses on the suffering behind all that, on the possible causes of that and what people can, on what people can do, people living in those difficult times can do to still live meaningful lives in such terrible conditions. The same is true of Gravity's Rainbow, in my opinion, even if at times all the silliness and all the slapstick and all the absurdities and the difficulty makes it hard to notice, I still believe once more, as I've been saying from the beginning of this project, that this is a novel with so much heart and so, much, so many chances for emotional connections, and I'm truly looking forward to reading part four. Uh, let me know what you think about all the topics I've mentioned mentioned in this video and about whatever else passes through your mind in the comments below. Let me know if you're excited to be reading part one or if you're exhausted by now uh, and I will see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching this one and bye guys. <music>